this is going to be a bit of content that none of you really expected or probably wanted. It's my book review of Hunting Monsters, Cryptozoology, and the Reality Behind the Myths, written by a British paleontologist in 2016 named Darren Naish or Naish. And I saw a video interview with this guy, and I really liked him. He's a skeptic and credentialed scientist who has um, written about cryptozoology and continued to write about cryptozoology in article form after the publication of this book. Despite the fact that I'm in the middle of another book, I rushed to get his book because I liked him so much in the interview. I thought he was, and still do, think that he was a, a, an intelligent, well-reasoned, and carefully reasoned thinker and skeptic. And I have always had a, an interest in cryptozoology my entire life, ever since I was a little kid. I have become less credulous over time. I don't think that I am particularly credulous anymore. I consider myself adequately skeptical, but a belief or a conviction in the reality of Sasquatch has remained with me and has kind of switched on and off through the years. I have found myself occupying both positions and I am more than happy to be proven wrong in that. In fact, it would be a great relief to not have to be the Bigfoot believer anymore because of the uh, amount of shit that I get from my friends for it. I'm kind of tired of going to bat for Bigfoot and getting getting a lot of uh, this face. I don't believe in ghosts. I don't believe in psychic phenomena. I don't believe uh, necessarily in aliens, I don't think. Um, this is kind of my one wacky thing. So anyway, I read the entire book. Bigfoot is just one part of it. He plays the hits. Starts out talking about sea monsters, then moves on to lake monsters like Loch Ness, then Bigfoot, and then kind of the also rands and everything else, everything other than Bigfoot, easily discarded. I just, you know, kind of probably too uncritically just took his word for it and agreed with him. And this is something that he, he criticizes cryptozoological hobbyists and believers for doing later in the book is in the buffet of cryptids, I have my favorite cryptid that I potentially maybe have confirmation bias at play in my thinking about. So that's possible. I don't think that that's true, but of course you can't fully be objective about yourself and your own beliefs and your own biases. So I'm, I may be biased. So I, ha I play my favorites. So that, that's what this video is gonna be about. The book review is, it's a pretty good book. It's very down the middle, strict. Like all, all of this can be dismissed after some consideration of the evidence. The evidence is lacking across the board to substantiate any of the claims made about the veracity of any of these big marquee cryptids as being uh, as being real animals that exist outside of being cultural phenomena. That's the basic thesis. And let's just switch over to talking about Bigfoot because that's what I wanna talk about. His argument, his explanation for Bigfoot is that when you examine each individual piece of evidence that is put forth as persuasive or constituting something like proof, um, it falls apart under careful scrutiny and that everything that is held forth as being unhoaxable inevitably can possibly be hoaxed and therefore it is safest to assume that it is hoaxed was hoaxed. So all the video evidence can be dismissed, or at least the one piece of video evidence that he talks about, the famous one, the Patterson-Gimlin film, because that can be dismissed, because the footprint evidence can be dismissed in his eyes, because the genetic evidence, the hair samples, the scat samples can be dismissed in his opinion, uh, or, or in his estimation, and because all that is left is eyewitness testimony and eyewitness testimony is inherently untrustworthy or inadmissible as constituting real evidence or reliable evidence. And because the eyewitness testimony 
is too broad in scope in terms of what it describes when it comes to Bigfoot that it can only really be explained and should really only be explained through the lens of this is a culturally driven phenomenon. It is a culturally colored quirk of the mind that occurs that's a combination of hallucination or mistaken identity and pareidolia. That's where you see shapes, images, faces, and, and just kind of static um, details. And that cryptozoology as a discipline should be relegated or kept in quarantine as a pseudoscience and studied as a cultural phenomenon. So the, the best use for it is from this removed meta angle of what can we learn about human behavior and human culture and human values and the way that the mind works by studying the cryptozoologists themselves. My response to this, again, as a non-credentialed, I'm just some liberal arts idiot with a channel about books about spaceships. Um, my, my response is, these are all arguments that I've encountered before. I don't think that they fully account for the most persuasive parts of the Bigfoot evidence. The stuff that prevents me from receding into the relatively more safe intellectual position of, yeah, you're probably right. This is probably just this mishmash of people bringing their prejudices uh, to bear on very mundane kind of psychological cognitive phenomena that occur. This is people wanting to believe something, going out into the world, seeking evidence for something that they want to believe is true and finding it. Um, people deluding themselves etc. That would be easier for me, but there are bits that stick. I will say also, there's definitely like a non-zero chance that, that um, Nash or Nice, sorry if I, one of those is mispronounced, actually watches this video. So if, if that is the case, please like feel free to debunk my arguments because um, I'd be curious to hear your responses. So he starts out the Bigfoot section by talking about the Patterson-Gimlin film. That's the most famous video of Bigfoot that everybody's seen, the famous thing where she's swinging the arms like this. Um, and there is a, a piece of circumstantial evidence that's proposed up top as being potentially a debunk or a reason to hold the credibility of the, the Patty Bigfoot in question, um, which is that Roger Patterson was a gifted artist who had produced a drawing of a Bigfoot based on eyewitness testimony. A year or two before the uh, film was shot that depicted a female Bigfoot with breasts in a similar kind of posture to the, uh, the Patty Squatch that you see in the film. And this is presented as well, this this so closely resembles the this, the Bigfoot in the film that it calls it into question. And he kind of just lays it out there and lets it sit as if it's this mic drop thing as like, ah, well, the guy who shot the film or was involved in shooting the film also drew a Bigfoot that closely resembled this Bigfoot in the film, which at face value I can see how it would maybe be persuasive, but also if we just accept for the sake of this argument that Bigfoot is in fact a real animal, of course it follows that if he's a good artist and if the eyewitness testimony was of a real animal and was communicated to him with an adequate amount of detail, that if he drew that real animal and then captured that real animal on footage, they would resemble one another. I don't see how this is damning at all. And, okay, yeah, like, why why would he have drawn a female Bigfoot with breasts and then would have filmed the female Bigfoot with breasts? Well, it's a 50-50 chance, isn't it, that it's going to be a female versus a male, assuming, again, that this is a real animal. Also, the, the proportions of Patty and the way that she moves in the footage have been held forth as kind of incontrovertibly evidence of it being real because 
the proportions in terms of the length of the limbs and the uh, proportionately how long the forearms are to the upper arms and where the knees are cannot and do not match up with known human proportion. Naish claims, or Naish claims, I'm sorry, uh, that that's not true. He said, he cites unnamed scientists who claim that uh, that's not true, that it does comport with known human dimensions, and that that style of locomotion can be faked potentially. The swinging of the arms and the, uh, the compliant gait, meaning she walks with bent knees, and also the fact that her foot comes up flat in the back that she raises the, the foot up like this, the foot of the sole up, the, the sole of the foot up, that those can be mimicked by people. Even assuming that it is possible that human, a human being could have faked it, does it logically follow that necessarily we must assume that therefore it was faked? Like again, assuming that it is a real animal and it's a bipedal upright hominid whose anatomy closely resembles that of a human being, is it within the realm of plausibility that we would share similar limb dimensions and that we would have distant but roughly approximate forms potentially of locomotion? Are we intellectually bound to assume that it is a hoax because it could potentially be a hoax? And that seems to be an ongoing assumption in all of these arguments which is because it is possible that these things could possibly be hoaxed, even though in a lot of circumstances, in my opinion, it really does beggar belief that they were hoaxed or consistently are hoaxed, that we are duty bound intellectually to lend all of the weight, all of the benefit of the doubt on the side of it was a hoax versus maybe it wasn't. If you watch the film, this is something that the the Sasquatch researchers and the Sasquatch apologists talk about all the time, is when you look at the musculature under the fur, you can see it moving. You can see it fluidly uh, reacting to her movements and locomoting um, in a way that looks entirely real. And in the book, he says, yes, it does appear that there is musculature at play at work under the fur, and uh, that it is it would be an extraordinary feat to pull that off with a fake costume, especially given the technology of the day, and that multiple attempts have been made to recreate such a costume with big budgets in more recent years, and they've all failed. However, it is possible that they got lucky. That's his actual argument, is that it is possible that the lighting conditions were just right and the way the costume moved was just perfectly in the Goldilocks zone of moving in the right way to create the illusion of all of that musculature at work under the fur, moving in exactly the right way, uh, so exactly right that people like Meldrum can point to these little discreet bits of uh, physiology, like he, he points out there's actually a visible herniation in one of her thighs that, that uh, rises when, at a certain point in inflection, just like an actual human herniated um, thigh muscle would move. That this is just luck, it's just dumb luck and pure accident. This is not a convincing argument to me. So is it possible that the Patterson-Gimlin film is fake? Yes, it is possible. It's not insane to think that it would be a fake, but this argument of because he did a drawing and because they had financial self-interest in Bigfoot already and because they went out specifically looking to film a Bigfoot and then filmed one, and that they either built a costume that defied the technology of the day or they just got extraordinarily lucky with a bad one. That's not like the final word to me. That's nowhere close to the final word. That's so much, that's so inadequate, especially in the face of an analysis like Meldrum's. I think he did score a point with a, a couple of the, the, the debunks of like 
the footprint evidence. So one of the bits of evidence in terms of like the footprint casts that's held forth as, uh, as like very, very compelling is the fact that you can see what look like dermal ridges around uh, the edges of the prints, uh, meaning like the, the ridges on your uh, fingerprints and toe pads, you can actually see them in some of the casts. And people like Meldrum say that this would be unthinkable to be hoaxed. He claims that somebody went and recreated that effect just by merit of how plaster naturally sets in a cast. So plaster solidifies in layers and those layers, those fine layers, roughly approximate what look like dermal ridges but are not dermal ridges. So maybe that's true. One of the other big pieces of evidence held forth for the legitimacy of the Bigfoot tracks is what uh, Meldrum calls the mid-tarsal break, meaning if you look at a lot of Bigfoot tracks that are considered credible, you will notice that there is a semi-diagonal ridge in the middle of the track. So there will be a deep depression and then a ridge here that's more shallow and then another deep depression here. And uh, Meldrum, and I don't fully understand or remember the defense of this, because I'm not a an expert, a science, uh, I'm, I don't have a doctorate in bipedal locomotion, I don't remember all the terminology, but his claim is that this represents a consequence of what's called a mid-tarsal break, which is a phenomena that occurs in apes and not humans, he claims, although this author claims that it does in 8% of humans, which, you know, which I don't think really is like that important an argument, I guess I'll get to that, but... Um, so his, his claim is that this mid-tarsal break is a hinge in the midfoot of the alleged Bigfoot creature that allows it to be more weight-bearing. So he claims that this is a smoking gun, that this, uh, this is not a detail that hoaxers would know to replicate. It's not, um, it's not a piece of information that was certainly available to the public at large when a lot of the tracks were made and casted back in the 70s and 80s. This was specialist knowledge known only to a handful of, uh, of like top, top, top experts who would even know about this. Um, and uh, Nash says that it does not actually represent or resemble a mid-tarsal break. It resembles a pressure ridge from, or I don't remember what he calls it, uh, he thinks that it's a product of a flat, rigid surface from a Bigfoot counterfeit shoe uh, pressing into substrate and creating that ridge. <sighs> Maybe. I hadn't heard that argument before. I really have trouble believing that that's not something that Meldrum considered. It also ignores one of the most, like a couple of the most compelling pieces of the argument, at least as proposed by Meldrum, which is there are bits of detail in the tracks like that, especially the mid-tarsal break, that are consistent across decades of time and thousands of miles of distance. Another part of his argument is that there are in these footprints, evidence of living flesh interfacing with the soil or the mud or whatever substrate it is that it, uh, it was compressed into, where bits of what appear clearly to be a living foot created subtle minor pressure ridges and depressions and slips and slides uh, in the process of locomoting through it. Also, there's the fact that these tracks are often found in extremely remote parts of the wilderness where there's nobody around, where nobody knew that the person who casted the tracks was going to be traveling, often after a fresh rain, meaning uh, three things. Either the person who casted the tracks hoaxed it themselves and fabricated the story. A, a hoaxer knew their plans or was just out there at random creating these extremely lifelike, detailed, sophisticated, fake tracks in the hopes that someone would encounter them uh, or that, it, that it's real. So one of those three. 
he scores another point, I think, in uh, talking about how there's there's really like not a candidate in the fossil record that would would really like uh, fit the description of Bigfoot as this like really large, heavy, totally bipedal ape that the 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 candidate most heavily cited in the fossil record is Gigantopithecus, and apparently Gigantopithecus thinking is was more like an orangutan who was probably a knuckle walker who didn't uh who could walk bipedally but probably did not for the most part meaning that something like gigantopithecus would have had to have evolved into something like bigfoot the gigantopithecus was in the same family as orangutans and uh a member, an ape in that family would have had to have independently evolved a human-like foot, uh, which would be unprecedented in the fossil record and is extremely implausible. That could very well be true, way outside my wheelhouse. The one part of the book where I am like in diametrical disagreement with him is his use of the eyewitness anecdotes the details in those anecdotes as some kind of self-evident debunk in and of itself of the the eyewitnesses describing such an insanely huge range of behaviors and attributes that it is patently not a real animal which is really frustrating and weird and confusing to me because this is the one argument that keeps me a believer that it's it's the exact, I have the complete opposite interpretation of it. He calls it a, uh, quote, vast pool of anecdotes, which it is, to begin with, uh, it is vast. There are thousands of encounter reports about Sasquatch, which sets it apart from the other cryptids where every once in a while, once a decade, somebody captures a photo of a log floating in a lake and says, I have seen Nessie, um, the Sasquatch encounters are constant. It is a vast body of anecdote. The remarkable thing about the body of anecdote is how uniform they actually are. There is variance. There's some extreme outliers, some paranormal bullshit. When you control for that and you can say, well, how is it fair to control for the paranormal claims? and say that the more mundane stuff is a legitimate part of the data set and the craziness isn't. I'm just making a subjective value judgment. I don't think that paranormal phenomena exist or are real. There, I don't think there's any reason to believe that they are, and I just fundamentally don't find those claims plausible. However, when you remove those out of the picture, all the stuff about the floating orbs and the UFOs, psychic big feet, whatever, um, you're left with an uncannily uniform set of traits and behaviors that are exhibited over and over and over and over again to the point where it becomes monotonous, where the monotony of the reports is, to me at least, the most compelling piece of evidence outside of whatever photographic evidence or video evidence, and there's a lot of it that's not talked about in the book that isn't the Patterson-Gimlin film, the thing that keeps me convinced is the fact that it is such a narrowly defined set of things that people observe and hear and smell when it comes to Bigfoot. And he runs through the whole list of of things of like, well, people say that they see them running. People say that they see them eating berries. Some people say they see them attacking deer. And isn't this, isn't this unthinkable? Isn't this clearly just an absurd diversity of behaviors? That's slightly, only slightly oversimplified or, or reduced in terms of the actual list. I could read it out, but this video is already long and boring enough, I'm sure. Um, so he lists off this like totally mundane range of behaviors that you would expect from any animal of like, they produce different noises, they eat different foods, they have different moods. Some of them are, some people consider them to be aggressive. Some people consider them to be uh, pacific and friendly giants. It, like any animal, especially a large mammal is going to exhibit a range of behaviors and nothing in the Bigfoot, like the main corpus of the Bigfoot eyewitness stuff 
is really that implausible or that different than any other known animal. The reason this is so convincing to me is that there's really only like five or six things that people report when it comes to Bigfoot outside of the physical description, which also is like nearly completely uniform. There's some variation in the color of the fur. There's variation in the description of like the, the facial features um, and the height, size, obviously, um, like the quality of the fur or if they're skinny or muscular, muscular or whatever, like all, if it, assuming it was a real animal stuff that you would expect to see in a population that has different morphologies, just like every animal does. Um, but outside of that, they only do a handful of things, or, or they have like a handful of behaviors that seem to be repeated over and over and over again through all of these eyewitness accounts. You see them pop up again and again and again. Even little tiny weird details keep cropping up again and again. It's not like the famous stuff. It's not the, the wood knocking that everybody knows about from TV. It's little stuff. Little stuff that you see over and over from people like across decades, across, you know, state lines, um, stuff like rocking. That's my favorite one because nobody, like, this is something that I just noticed from imbibing all of these field reports or not like the eyewitness reports on the internet. Uh, all the time people report they will, if they actually like make visual eye contact with one, they'll be peering out from behind a tree and they'll be doing this thing where they're rocking back and forth on their feet. I've read this dozens and dozens of times. Uh, this is not like a famous Bigfoot behavior, but it's something that crops up in the same context it, where, when the animal is, is placed in the same circumstance of being slightly alarmed or curious, uh, unsure if the person that they're encountering is a threat. That's always always when you see the rocking back and forth. I don't know if that has some like significant corollary in the world of primatology. I, this is just something that I have noticed reading the, the reports. The, the tree knocking sound is, you know, debated and I have a story about that. I think that's not like the most strong piece of evidence. Um, the throwing of rocks. Um, he talks about this briefly and his explanation for the fact that this happens like all the time in Bigfoot reports where people have rocks, sometimes quite large ones, thrown near them uh, or small, tiny rocks at them that will hit them or hit their tent or hit their cabin that they're staying in. Rocks will be thrown. Um, and he says, well, these could be rocks that are rolling down hillsides and then flying through the air. Or, quote, there are pranksters everywhere. Which, again, like... <sighs> because it could be hoaxed is the simplest explanation that it was all hoaxed. That these hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rock throwing incidents were the result of pranksters for some reason being out in deep remote parts of the wilderness where there was no guarantee that they would encounter another person uh, throwing rocks at strangers who are all for the most part armed and scared does that make sense does that really make sense and in places like deep forests like heavily forested areas where there aren't like big rocky mountains nearby does that make sense that it's pranksters or rocks rolling down? Is that the most simple solution or explanation? The weird smell, the really strong, pungent, weird, distinct and horrible odor that's associated uh, with Sasquatch. Um, the calls, the weird calls, which he again hand waves away as animals make weird calls. The whooping, the screeching, and especially the chatter um, has not been, to my knowledge, satisfactorily attributed to any known animal. And this isn't just eyewitness reports, there's audio recordings of it. So I encourage you to listen to some of those and say that that can be explained away by owls or bobcats or coyotes or wolves or whatever. It's just like, it's just not that. 
So it's either something else or it's faked. But it's, again, the same handful of vocalizations that are always reported. There's just like two or three of them. There's the whooping, there's the howling, and there's occasionally, every so often, the samurai chatter, which is reported to be like kind of a proto-language. I think that's verging on like the periphery of plausibility. However, there is a recording of it. And I know that there was an, an analysis done by like a military language expert who claimed that there were like all of the signs of it being an actual language and not a known language. So for whatever that's worth, it, it is kind of outlandish, but it's still significant to me that there's only like a couple of these vocalizations that are reported. Um, like, why not, why not other stuff? There's also certain behaviors that are in all of, like, so often in these reports where people report the Bigfoot being just out of sight, like being very good at hiding itself, and also tracking movement. So paralleling and tracking movement. Um, so someone will hear, like, rustling in the bushes, and they'll stop and the rustling will stop and then they'll keep going and the the thing will like move parallel to them with them over and over and over and over and over 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 again all the time in these reports there's so many details like this that again are like not not part of most people's like casual vocabulary when it comes to bigfoot also a ton of these are reported from eras before Bigfoot was super duper popular and overexposed on, on television. Stuff from like the 60s, 70s, 80s, when yes, people knew about Bigfoot, but did people know about the like side rocking and the rock throwing and the whooping and um, stuff like that? Like, or the tree pe peeping? Um, and of course, like one of the, the big arguments in the book that has to be grappled with is the argument that Human memory is fallible, and eyewitness testimony is fundamentally flawed. That's uncontroversial, I think. Um, people develop false memories all the time. In fact, tellingly, I have a false memory from when I was three or four years old of being on a playground and looking over at a chain link fence and seeing an orangutan on the other side of the fence shaking the fence like this. I can picture it like with perfect, crystal clear, vivid detail as a real memory, never happened. I have no idea where it came from, how it got there. But like a perfect illustration of the fact that it is possible for false memories to occur or for real memories to be misinterpreted over time or for detail to deteriorate or to be replaced or to be susceptible to suggestion. Um, so memory is fallible. Uh, but, but there is such a, an absolute preponderance of these anecdotes, and there is such uniformity between them on all of these kind of lateral levels of they share all of these details that I don't think it can be hand waved away as eyewitness testimony is worth nothing. Just because eyewitness testimony and memory are fallible doesn't mean that they are completely without merit or value. And sure, maybe like they're not they can't be submitted as hard scientific proof, but I don't think that it can just be disregarded either. Like if eyewitness testimony was truly valueless, what, like it wouldn't be, it would play no role at all in the legal system and clearly it does. Like it, it requires uh, like careful tending. Uh, people talk a lot about eyewitness testimony not being polluted in the way or, or contaminated rather like there have to be strict procedures for how questions are asked and details are extracted from people so they're not like susceptible to suggestion and the the detail the valuable detail isn't lost but clearly like eyewitness testimony still plays some kind of significant and essential role in the legal system so what like why should it be completely inadmissible in the court of the speculative science um, or like citizen science, Wh why is it okay or sound or intellectually honest just to dismiss all of it as kookery or delusion or fake memory or 
um, like debauched memory. I just don't think it's fair and I don't think that it's smart to do that. Like the main thrust of his argument and the, the kind of concluding thesis statement is that in the absence of any compelling physical evidence, which again, I don't agree with his assessment, but even so, in the absence of, of like good, good evidence, all of these sightings, all of this eyewitness testimony has to be explained in the context of it's either hallucination or it's, um, it's an expression of a, an archetype, some kind of mental bugbear that people have that's built into us, uh, this image of the wild man being something like this, this image, this creature that we auto-generate through our psychology. So people are um, succumbing to this kind of pareidolia where they see something and then their cultural programming and kind of their archetypal set point generates an experience of having seen a Bigfoot. And that that is the best way to explain it, that it's a cultural phenomena, phenomenon and a psychological one. And that somewhere where the twain shall meet is where you will find Bigfoot and all cryptids. It's not an argument that can be dismissed completely. I also think that it's a lame argument. I think it, it's like tasty on paper if you're, a do if you're like committed to the premise of it not possibly being real or all of the evidence being completely uncompelling, you are kind of left with that of like, people are lying and or people are just like seeing something that isn't there. What other ex explanation can there possibly be? I think there are bits of circumstantial evidence that suggest that this just isn't true. To begin with, there are lots of accounts of simultaneous sightings of a Bigfoot. Many, many people seeing the same Bigfoot at the same time. Uh, so, or I guess the argument would be that somebody is having this experience of generating the image of the Bigfoot based on whatever unrelated input is coming in. So like they see a bear, they see a Bigfoot, and then other people see the bear, but then they're influenced by this narrative that this person projects of it was a Bigfoot, and then their memory is revised to reflect the Bigfoot. So I think that would be the argument of to explain like multiple sightings. So multiple people see a Bigfoot at the same time. They have the same shared experience. They come to a consensus about what they saw. Uh, sometimes these same people see a Bigfoot multiple times. There are multiple accounts of families living in homes in remote parts of the country that uh, experience repeat visitations by a Bigfoot or Bigfoots who eat their chickens or eat apples off their trees or are just curious about them as kind of interlopers in their environment, which again is like a consistent theme in these eyewitness uh, testimonies. So there, they're having all the same hallucination or they are all caught in this trance of suggestibility of they all are convincing themselves or being convinced by one of their party that they're seeing something that isn't there or they're all seeing a real thing. Which of these is the simplest? It seems obvious to me that Occam's razor would say that the most obvious and simple explanation is just that they're all seeing a real animal. I should have said this earlier, probably a ton of these eyewitness accounts do not actually correspond with seeing or hearing or whatever a real Bigfoot. Even if 99% of them are false, even if there is 1% that corresponds with an actual animal, that means that it's real. A lot of the people that see Bigfoot, when they're interviewed about it, like they have this attitude of, I know exactly what I saw and no one will ever convince me otherwise. I saw it in broad daylight. I was face to face with it. 
Uh, I saw it in full detail. I saw the facial features. I saw how it moved. I heard it. I smelled it. I've been in the woods forever since I was a little kid. I know what bears are. I know what cougars are. Uh, I know that I saw something that is not one of those animals. And uh, I don't care if you believe me or not. And I'm going to go to my deathbed knowing that these creatures are real. This is something that you hear said a lot. So of course, conviction of belief is not actually evidence of the veracity of the belief. If that were true, then every religious zealot in the world uh, would have to be taken at face value. I mean, it's just, it's so different. It's so different than like Loch Ness or any other cryptid. Most of them are just like, yeah, I saw something weird. It was moving weird. I don't know what I saw. Uh, I feel like it was a monster, but who knows? It's not what you get with a lot of these Bigfoot people. It's like, it was in my backyard. I had my flashlight on it. Uh, it grimaced at me. I saw how huge it was and it ran off. And when it ran, it ran in a way that I've never seen another human being run. That's another one of those little, little details that sneaks into all these eyewitness testimonies of people see them running across broken terrain and they just seem to glide. They just seem to be so coordinated or have this like weird form of locomotion where they just effortlessly kind of zoom over the ground. This thing that just people who don't know anything about Bigfoot before they had the sighting report in accordance with all of these other synonymous details that echo other reports. Also, if it's, if it's a hallucination or if it's a product of pareidolia of you take a human being, you put them in a wilderness context, you expose them to certain stimuli, they see or hear certain things and it generates the wild man archetype hallucination. If that is accepted as true as an inherent human property, it would follow logically that the frequency and density of Bigfoot sightings uh, would correspond with population density. You would think that the Bigfoot hallucination would be generated the most often where there are the most people, and it's not the case. It's just not the case. There are uh, regional distinctions in terms of parts of the country and parts of the world that are way disproportionately dense in Bigfoot sightings, and it does not correspond with population density. That's a study that's been run, and there's maps that you can look at that prove it. Also, why is the hallucination apparently seasonal? So the Bigfoot sightings, there's a, a, a field biologist named John, uh, John Mayanzinski who's uh, interested in Sasquatch, and he made his living tracking black bear. Um, and creating predictive models of where black bear migrations would occur and where black bears could be sighted. And he found that black bears could easily be predicted based on seasonality, like rainfall, and also the fruiting of berries, like, um, like small fruits. And he overlaid Bigfoot sighting data on top of it and it comports like perfectly, like it's the same map. So. Bigfoot sightings can apparently be at least somewhat predicted based on the, uh, the fruiting of berries um, and also by rainfall. So there is data sets that show that areas that have a certain range, a relatively high range of rainfall, enjoy disproportionate amounts of reported Bigfoot activity. It's a fundamental human characteristic that we hallucinate an animal only in certain parts of the world at certain times of year when environmental conditions are favorable for it. Is that the most elegant solution? Is that the simplest explanation for it? Probably nobody's watching this video anymore, but I wanna also offer a similar argument that I've actually never heard brought up. Uh, which is the example of Kodiak Island in Alaska. So this, I actually used to work on Kodiak Island. I was a fishing guide. And my first season up there, I asked one of the senior guides at this wilderness lodge if there had ever been a Bigfoot sighting on Kodiak. And he immediately said no. And I've double checked that multiple times over the years. And it's true. There has never been a single Bigfoot encounter reported on Kodiak Island, which is a uh, huge island that sits kind of at the base of the Aleutian chain. Uh, and Kodiak is famous for 
being home to a massive population of Kodiak bears, which is a subspecies of brown bear. So uh, there are, I think the number is like twice as many bears as human beings on the island, but there's a lot of human beings on the island. There is a population center, the town of Kodiak, that has a full year round population and it gets this massive influx of people during the summer both for commercial fishing and also for recreational fishing, which is, you know, where I worked. So there's people out on the road systems all across the island throughout the summer months, um, and there's people there year round. Not a single Bigfoot encounter. Surrounded by bears, you run into bears all the time. You're in the deep woods, you're in a, a landscape that adopting the archetype model should generate the archetype hallucination because it's all like deeply alder forested kind of rugged terrain mountains lots of rocks shadows weird shapes and lots of apex predators brown large mammalian apex predators that can stand on their hind legs that are often quoted as a mistaken identity culprit for sasquatch you cannot help but run into them and see them kind of off in the distance sometimes or through the brush um, you would think that the conditions would be perfect for people to see these hallucinated uh, false Sasquatches, but it never happens. Never happens. You look at the map of Bigfoot sightings and the entire mainland around the island, dot, 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 Bigfoot everywhere. Way less human density in these giant tracts of mainland wilderness. Uh, infinitely more Bigfoot encounters. How does this fit? How does it fit the hallucination model? It just doesn't. Maybe the definitive debunk is out there. I don't think that it was in this book. And I'm, I'm open to being proven a fool on this. I don't think that I'm being credulous. I do have a history of being credulous though. So I'll, I'll end on a funny story for the three of you that are still watching. Uh, so recently, actually, I went on a hiking trip with a friend of mine from college. We were hiking to this remote uh, kind of cabin out in the deep woods in uh, Colorado. I don't remember the name of the mountain range, but it was like this alpine wilderness. And we hiked into the cabin and it was just the two of us. And then we were sharing the cabin with this middle-aged couple from uh, the Midwest and their dog. There was a whole, it was like a whole other story, but we couldn't find the drinking water uh, well. There was like a natural spring that was described to us and we couldn't find it. <clears throat> so we're walking all over the place and we walked down this trail and we spotted this weird thing happening with these trees. There were like two huge dead trees that were in this like uprooted and jammed into this weird position where they were like lodged together in kind of this teepee for like form. And it was like in this really strange place. And of course, mentally, I know like the TP structures are allegedly like Bigfoot activity. I'm pretty skeptical about that. I don't think that necessarily that's, that's really that convincing. But anyway, so I have that in the back of my mind. It's like, huh, weird tree structure. And then eventually, like long story short, we did end up finding the spring. Um, that night I was sitting out on kind of these stumps and it just turned dark and I heard this caribou bugle up on this hillside behind the cabin um, and right after the caribou bugled I heard this knock 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 a tree knock three of them like right in a row like bang 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 and then a few beats later off in the distance uh, on the same hillside I heard another tree knock so bang 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 like a few seconds pass but then another knock and my friend came out of the cabin to kind of join me or no he was there so he heard it too so he heard like the caribou and the the two the tree knocks he says he didn't hear three in a row but he didn't hear, he heard the tree knocks and i had kind of been like restraining like holding myself back from the bigfoot stuff because i whatever i knew that he didn't believe in it and thought i was a moron and i couldn't really understand myself at that point and i was like holy shit dude like this is the thing that you know on the like the tree knocking this big a bigfoot thing and he was like kind of rolling his eyes, whatever, whatever. And I kept standing out there. And a couple minutes later, I heard another like loud 
tree knock. And it sounded just like the tree knocks on Finding Bigfoot or from like the videos online. It sounded like someone took a baseball bat and hit it against the side of a tree. It was loud, like unmistakably a single tree knock uh, closer to the cabin down the hill from us. And at this point, I was like losing my mind. I was full red alert, like I am having my first Bigfoot encounter. I stood out there for probably two hours. I got my friend's down sleeping bag uh, and used it as like a shawl because it was deathly cold. And I kept hearing tree knocks. Every like half an hour to an hour, I would hear a tree knock somewhere. And um, I ended up staying up, sitting on the steps of the cabin until probably one in the morning or something. Just full, like full blown, having borderline a religious experience, listening to tree knocks in the woods. It was like the most exhilarating experience of my life. I mean, it was like indescribably exciting because I was hearing Bigfoot and uh, I heard there was like some other weird stuff. I heard another uh, elk bugle. Did I say caribou before it was an elk? Um, also heard this weird noise of like, it sounded like someone picked up a huge rock and slammed it full tilt into another rock down in the woods, like weird out of nowhere. Um, also, I had noticed that the sides of this cabin were like uh, the corrugated aluminum, whatever metal it was, pockmarked everywhere with these small dents from rocks being thrown at it, like every surface. So I was just waiting. I was like waiting, all of my senses activated, like hair standing, I'm like, the hair standing up on my neck now, even just talking about it, waiting to hear the whoop, waiting to hear the the wail in the woods. I finally went inside because I just got too freaked out and climbed up into my bunk bed and pr I think I slept half an hour that night. I was laying on my back awake looking at the ceiling of the cabin. Full body waves of goose flesh thinking about like I can't believe that this has happened to me. I have finally f had my Sasquatch experience. And throughout the whole night, I kept hearing the knocking. I never heard like the whoops and I kept waiting to hear like a rock hit the side of the cabin. Cause like I said, that's a thing that's commonly reported. But I, I, the knocking just got louder and louder to the point where it genuinely sounded like there was a pro wrestler standing outside, slamming a baseball bat into a tree right outside the cabin. I woke up before anybody else right after dawn and I had this plan of like, I'm gonna run down to the spring because I knew that by the spring there was a, this patch of mud and I wanted to see if I could find a track. So I ran down, I looked around, I didn't see any tracks, but I started hearing these wood knocks all around me. I kind of crept into the woods and I was staring out into the woods looking at, for the source of the wood knocks and they just kept coming and coming and coming. And I realized there were squirrels up in the trees that were dislodging these little pine cones, like this big, that were falling onto fallen tree trunks on the forest floor that were dried out. And they were falling and hitting with such force that it produced an incredibly loud wood knocking noise. So I had been up all night listening to squirrels. And it was so easy to construct that narrative because I wanted to step into it. Of All the details were there. Not only like the, the tree structure, the wood knocking, um, the sound of the, the, the rock, the, the detail of like the indentations on the cabin that seemed to suggest like rock throwing. But also at some point in the night, I had also gotten up to go pee because the, the guy sharing the cabin with us had gotten, like, gotten up to pee and I needed to pee. So I went out there, it was still dark, and through the trees, for some reason, there was someone with a flashlight in the distance. There was this like weird light kind of floating around out in the trees, just in the middle of nowhere. 
presumably it was like a hunter or camper or something with this floating like light, this orb of light that disappeared after a while. It's kind of weird. Uh, and that's like a common thing that people, paranormal Bigfoot people report. So I had all the ingredients for a Bigfoot field report and it was an open and shut case in my mind. And then I realized that I had been blinded by um, my bias, my desire to have a Bigfoot experience. So I closed the video on that anecdote to illustrate that uh, I'm acutely consciously aware that your enthusiasms or my specific enthusiasms can lead you slash me into troubled waters and I'm open to being wrong and I'm open to this entire conviction and the existence of Bigfoot being a case of falling acorns as it were but as it stands right now I don't think that it's I think that it's more rational to believe that they are more likely to be real than that they're a product of this pastiche of unconvincing, uh, hypothetical, psychological misfires. I, I just think the former is more believable than the latter. If you think that I am wrong, please tell me why.